Well, tonight we're going to look into the book of Matthew. So if you would, take out your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 14. I'm going to uh, uh, speak on the subject, one word, it's called immediately. And we're going to see throughout this passage here in a moment that that word is used three different times. And we're going to uh, talk about it and uh, expand upon it here in just a moment. But how many of you enjoy or have enjoyed at some point in your life a boat ride? Anybody? I remember growing up, we would go, uh, uh, we'd go boat, boating quite a bit. We didn't own a, own a boat, but we knew some folks that did. And, and we just had an incredible time doing that. And I know when Denise and I got married, we, when we first got married, now this was 40 years ago, we would go, uh, water skiing. I wouldn't even, even think about doing that now. But uh, she would get on that one ski, I think they call it a, a solemn, and she would just go to town on that. We love being on the water. Denise and I have been on seven different cruises uh, in our married life. We love being on the water. But one of the things that happened in my life when I was, uh, I was about 15, 16 years old, we went on a canoe trip. Now, I don't think we call a canoe a boat, right? But at least it's out of the water, okay? And so we are on the Illinois River, and we are, we are canoeing, having a great time. The sun is shining, and it's just a wonderful, wonderful day. And we get halfway through our trip. We had a 12-mile trip, so we got halfway to the six-mile marker. And my youngest brother, uh, who was four years old at the time, he decided he wanted to get out of the canoe and stay with the people uh, that we had registered with. And for whatever reason, he wanted out of the boat. And so dad and mom decided that it was okay, and he, they left Keith with these folks. We got started on the second leg of our journey after eating lunch. And would you believe, in about 30 minutes after we get on the second half, a storm begins to arise. And it arrived very quickly. And this storm was, was uh, well, as a matter of fact, we found out later there was a tornado just a couple of miles away. So you can, you can imagine what kind of, uh, of wind there was. And we're out in the middle of this, uh, out in the middle of the Illinois River. And all of a sudden, Jay and I are in a canoe. And all of a sudden, Dad and Mom tump their canoe tumps. And the rapids are, are pretty swift. And, and, um, We lose track of them, and mom's flailing, and she's trying to get back in the canoe, and dad's trying to get back in the canoe, and Jay and I, we're we're down uh, river of them, and we're trying to go back to help mom and dad. Well, it was impossible. You know, we would get almost there, and all of a sudden, we're 50 yards away from them again because of the current. We just didn't have the strength to get up there to deal with it. Well, it wasn't long. That fog set in. The storm had subsided and the fog set in. Well, we couldn't even see where mom and dad were at, even if they had gotten out of the water. And we finally got our canoe over to the side and we just kind of walked along uh, the, the bank trying to find mom and dad. And would you believe, now my dad was six foot eight. My dad caught his foot on a log, got his foot caught on a log, kept his head above water and kept my mother above water. And all we could see above the fog was my dad's head and his hat. That could have been an incredibly tragic day. But we got word to the the powers that be, and they they got a boat there, and they got mom and dad out. And I thought my mom was going to kill my dad for bringing her on a canoe. She didn't want to go in the first place. But here's the thing. What if my little brother had not had the inclination of getting out of that boat when he was four years old? No doubt my little brother would have drowned on that particular day. So God has a way of of making things happen. Now in this particular story, you're so familiar with it. It's one of those stories that we teach our kids about. It's one of those stories that that, uh, you could write a movie about it and have a movie about it. And it's the story of where Jesus walks on the water. 
Now, I want us to begin in verse number 22. And when we read that, I want you to notice the first word here in just a moment. But I'm going to give you three things to think about uh, throughout this passage. So the first one is this. We need to obey God immediately. We must obey God immediately. Secondly, we must trust God immediately. Trust God immediately. And the third thing is we need to depend on God immediately. Now, when we obey, that means we're going to submit to the authority of someone. I remember my dad, he made it very clear if we disobeyed, we would be punished for that. And so growing up, I learned the importance of obedience. And I think that uh, we need to have that obedience to our Heavenly Father uh, throughout our day and throughout our lives. So let's begin with verse 22. It says, Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. Now I find it interesting that he says immediately because there was something that was incredible that just had just taken place. The feeding of the 5,000 men plus the women and children, perhaps 15 to 20,000 people fed those five loaves and two fish. And can you imagine the disciples sitting around watching what the Lord was doing as he was dispersing the fish and the, and the, and the, and the bread. And, and you know the story where there were 12 baskets that were full of leftovers. And so everybody got their fill, the Bible says, and everybody was full uh, after eating uh, the fish. So incredible miracle that God, that Jesus had performed. And he says here immediately to his disciples, I want you to get in a boat. Now, the book of John teaches us that the crowd was, was very interested in making Jesus king. And you remember, they, they wanted Jesus to come and overrule Rome and, and become the king at that particular time. And Jesus knew that. And so I believe that's one reason why he told his disciples to immediately get into the boat. And so it says here, they, got, they get into the boat, they go before him to the other side while he sends the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now you've got to remember the Sea of Galilee is not a big, huge body of water. And so they're probably, at this particular time, they're about three miles out. And they are, uh, they are professional fishermen, so this is nothing new for them. They, they, they lived their life, half of their life perhaps, even in a boat fishing. So this was not new to them. But I think this word immediately is important to this part of the story because it reminds us of how, act how life actually works. A lot of big changes in our life, whether it's good or bad, happen immediately. Now you think about some good things. You learn that you get that promotion. Immediately your life has changed. You hear about uh, you're going to have a child or you're going to have a grandchild. Immediately your life changes. There are those life-changing events often that are very positive, and we love those positive things that happen immediately. But there's also those times, those unwelcome events in our life. Those times when something bad happens, like an illness or an accident, the death of a loved one, and instantly, immediately, our lives are changed. And my heart, folks, goes out to the people in Georgia today over the tragic shooting there in another high school. Immediately lives were altered. Immediately lives were changed. Well, think about the Apostle Peter. After he denied the Lord the third time, what happened? The rooster crowed, didn't it? Well, don't you think that changed his life? Because he, he remembered what the Lord said. The Lord told him he was going to do that. He said, no, I, I, I wouldn't do that, Lord. But he did. And it altered his life. But some of that alteration was a good thing because it turned out after the Lord had, in John chapter 21, the Lord had restored him. Peter became an incredible man of God. 
And so we see here in this first point that uh, in this gospel story that the change that they experienced was at the command of Jesus. He commanded them to get into the boat. Now, can you imagine Jesus? He's up on the mountain and he's praying and he knows very well what's going to happen. All of a sudden, the wind begins to blow. All of a sudden, the waves begin to rise. All of a sudden, they're being battered and, and, and torn asunder on this boat. And Jesus knows exactly what's going on. And you know what? In verses 25 through 27, we have what I call the epicenter of this story. This is the part where Jesus actually comes walking on the water. Now, even non-church people know about this story. You know, they'll talk about Noah and the ark. They'll talk about Jonah and the whale. They'll talk about those kind of, even though they may not be in church, they've heard these stories. And they've heard about Jesus walking on the water. And if you'll notice in verse 25, it says, In the fourth watch of the night... That means it was 3 o'clock in the morning till 6 o'clock in the morning. The fourth watch, okay? And so Jesus, uh, on that fourth watch of the night, went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. Now, I find it interesting that they did not recognize who Jesus was at that particular time. Now, you can imagine looking toward the horizon and, and the waves are, are high, the wind is blowing hard, and, and you see this ghostly looking figure coming at you. We would probably, if we would have been in that boat, we would have probably done the same thing that they did. We'd have thought it was a ghost. And that's exactly what the Word of God says here. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost, and they cried out, for fear. But I want you to notice the next time the word immediately occurs. Notice here, verse 27. But immediately, you see that? Jesus spoke to them saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. How many of you have ever, and I'm not talking about a literal storm, I'm talking about a, a, a physical storm or a financial storm or a mental storm. Have you ever been in one? Either you're in one or you've been in one or you're going to go through another one. I think of you, Tony, you've been through a very physical, challenging boat ride, if you will. But Jesus has been there the whole time, has he not? Can't you hear him saying to you in his, in his voice and, and through the Spirit of God saying, be of good cheer. Tony, it's I. Do not be afraid. And I use Tony as an example because we talk about that and we've talked about that. How he experienced the very presence of God in a very dire situation of his life. And you've been there too, haven't you? And you've heard in, your, in, in God's way how he does it through the Spirit of God. He'll say, don't worry about it. I've got this. It is I. Do not be afraid. Now, I love the fact that we can trust and place our total trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. I love the fact that he knows exactly where we're at. He knows exactly what we're going through. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us in Psalm 32, verse 8, it says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. And then in Proverbs 15, verse 3, it says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place. That means that he's going to notice where you're at. That means he's going to know the boat ride that you're going through. That means that he is going to be in the storm with you. He is going to be on the boat with you, if you will. He is going to be with us. Now, the disciples were not immediately comforted in this situation. Even though they saw this figure walking on the water, it made them fear and tremble. They cried out in fear. 
And the Bible tells us in Psalm 34, verse 7, it says, The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of their troubles. Now, folks, that doesn't mean we're not going to go through trouble. It means he will go with us through the trouble. Tony, you've experienced that. You told me time after time, visiting you in the hospital, that God's got this. Time after time. Well, the third time that the word immediately shows up, you're going to notice this. In verse 28 and on, it says, Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Now, I love that. I love the faith that he had getting out of the boat. And I don't know how many steps he took. I don't know how far away Jesus was. He had to be pretty close. And Peter puts one foot out of the boat, and then he puts another out of the boat, and he begins to walk on water like it's cement. So the Lord says, well, come on, Peter. And Peter gets out of the boat. He starts walking on the water toward Jesus, and he seems to be doing it very well. And then he notices the storm. And folks, we do that all the time. We begin to notice the storm. Then he began to get frightened, and then he began to sink. Now, folks, the storm was there the whole time, right? Right? The water was there the whole time, but Jesus was there the whole time. So something changed. So what changed? Jesus didn't change. Something happened in Peter's life, and something changed. And what changed was Peter's faith. That's what it had to be. So he, he began to doubt, and what happened is he took his eyes off of Jesus. He began to look at the storm around him. He began to look at the wind above him. He began to look at the water below him. And he started to sink. Now, if you get anything out of this tonight, I want you to get these two things. Number one, what people focus on becomes magnified. So if you just focus on the storm of your life, it's going to get magnified. It's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger every day. But here's the second thing I want you to get. The difference between faith and fear is focus. You get it? The difference between faith and fear is focus. What happened when Peter took his eyes off Jesus? He began to focus on something else. What happens when we take our eyes off of Jesus, folks? I'm guilty of it. Are you? You ever taken your eyes off Jesus? You ever lost focus in your, in your spiritual life? I'm going to raise both hands. I have. And so have you if you're really honest. So what people focus on becomes magnified. And the difference between faith and fear is focus. So in verse 30, it says, When he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. Now, if I'd have been there, if I'd have been the Lord, I'd have said, I'm going to let you, I'm gonna let you bob around a little bit. I'm going to let you go under and then paddle back up. I'm going to let you do that a few times. No, that's not what Jesus did. What does it say? And immediately, you get that? Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him. And he said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Folks, not only have I heard the voice of Jesus through his spirit speak to my heart, but I've, I've heard him say to me, Why are you doubting? Why have you lost faith? And so Peter, in a panic, cries out. And immediately, Jesus reaches out his hand. Man, I'm thankful we have a Savior like that. When they got into the boat, it tells us in verse 32, the wind ceased. 
The Bible says he's the master of the wind anyway, right? I remember the, the other time the disciples were in a boat and Jesus was down. He was in the bottom of the boat. He was asleep in a storm just raging. And, you know, they go down and wake him up. Why are you waking me up? But what Jesus do, he rebuked the wind in a way because he's the master of the sea. Well, in this short devotional message tonight, I want you to know he's the master of your sea. And he's in your boat. And you need to remember that when we go through the storms of life. And there's so many storms that we go through. A lot of them that we've gone through has made us better Christians, to be honest. And I think that's some of the reason why we go through the storms of life. It makes us stronger for the Lord. So how about obey, ob your obedience in the Lord? Do you obey the Lord? He might tell you to immediately get in this boat, knowing that you're going to go through something. What about trusting in the Lord? Do you trust, totally trust in the Lord? Or do you lean to your own understanding? Or how about your reliance on the Lord? Do you totally rely on Him? I'm telling you what, if Peter had to rely on those disciples that were still in the boat, he'd have drowned. But because Jesus reached down, he was delivered. And listen, if we go through life knowing that Jesus is always there, it's going to make it a whole lot easier to go through life. Let's bow and let's have a word of prayer and then we'll do our, our Bible, our uh, prayer list and then we'll have our prayer time uh, here tonight. Heavenly Father, thank you for this passage. Thank you for the lessons that we can glean from it. And Lord, I just pray, Lord, that uh, we go through the storms. We'll always look back even on stories like this knowing that you're there for us. And so Father, I pray you'll be with each and every one of us and Lord, uh, that we'll always be obedient, we'll always trust in you, and we'll always rely upon your hand. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right.